Sonny Danhouse, United States Army, Vietnam. I had the great pleasure and opportunity of meeting and interviewing Sonny in Brenham, Texas. It was February 10th, 2010. He was drafted into the Army in 1967, went to basic training at Fort Polk, Louisiana, was trained as 11 Bravo, which is an infantryman. He was in Vietnam and he tells a great story, folks. He's one of my Texas veterans, one of my Vietnam veterans, and I'm just grateful for his story. He was fantastic when I interviewed him. He served with the 35th Infantry Regiment, and he's just a blessing to know. I'd like to thank Harry Marshall for making it possible for you to listen and to watch Sonny's interview today. Harry, thank you. God bless you, sir. I salute you, and I thank you for your patriotism and your wanting to help me get these stories out. And folks, I encourage you, those of you that are being blessed and watching these interviews, please, let's pay it forward. Let's help um, continue this work that I've done. All the interviews are done. I did them many years ago. Now I'm releasing them one by one. Never thought I'd be doing that. Most of these veterans are featured in my documentaries that are on my YouTube channel. So I give you the chance and the opportunity to sponsor one of these stories. There is information in the video description below this video and in the comment section if you'd like to donate to my work. Or my website, LarryCapetto.com. Check it out, folks. Okay, let's watch Sonny Danhouse from Brenham, Texas, about 12 years ago, almost 13 years ago now. And um, this is on the Voices of History channel. Subscribe to the channel, folks. Share this channel. And let's keep this thing going, okay? Freedom is not free. Freedom is earned. And there's a price to pay for our freedoms. And let's never let our freedom slip away in this country. Okay, God bless you. Four years old. 64. Now you don't look 64, by the way. So, Thank you. So the camera makes you look 44. How's that? That's great. Okay. Tell me what year you went into the military. 1967. And were you drafted? Drafted. Right out of high school or? Out of Blend College. I was graduated from college, uh, Blend Junior College. And got married. Six months later, they drafted me. So you got your draft notice. Did you know? Well, how much did you know about Vietnam at that time? It had been going on for a bit. And... Yeah, and I had gone to school at Blinn with a guy that had been to Vietnam already in 65. So, And he was in school in 66. What with... branch of the military? I was in the Army. Where did you go to basic training? Fort Polk, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. Were you trained in the infantry or where were you trained? Infantry. 11 Bravo? 11 Bravo. Wow. So what's going through your head at boot camp? <laughs> I mean, are you thinking this is fun, or I'm going to Vietnam, or what are you what are you thinking about? Well, basically, just learning what I was supposed to be, knowing what I was going to do, and just to get through, get through my two years of service, and get it over with, get out and go back to school. So you did a tour over in Vietnam one year. One year. Mm -hmm. Tell me, it always intrigues me though about boot camp because. With the war going on, you know, you did the eight, you're a young man. Um, sometimes you feel invincible, maybe not. I mean, tell me about going to Vietnam and how you felt when you first arrived. Well, I spent uh, 21 days on a ship going across first with a unit. And we arrived in Quinh Yan, Vietnam, on a uh, ship and got off on a landing craft and drove up on the beach. With no weapons, anything. Carrying your duffel bag, and we loaded on a airplane and flew in country to a little place called Duck Fo, mm -hmm. and uh, was met with a military band, which struck me very odd. Uh, they instructed us in some things for a few days. Uh, issued weapons the same day we got there. Told us about things that were going on, uh, that people, or zappers were coming through the wires and they had all these big tents and they had trenches dug all around them. And that's 
where you were supposed to go at night in case something happened. As a matter of fact, the first night there, one of the guys in the tent next to us thought he saw something and opened up in the tent and wounded a couple of the guys that came with us. And I had a friend of mine that was with me from San Angelo that slept in the bunk next to me and when it went off, he was just laying there and I just kicked his bunk over because I was already on the bed, on the ground. And they cleared it up, but they hauled him off and sent him back to the States already. He was wounded? No. No? But he wouldn't, he wouldn't have been in any of the units. But uh, after that, we went out. The first 45 days that I was there, I spent in the field. Tell me about a, a normal day, if there is a normal day. <laughs> the first time you encountered the BC or the NBA, I don't know who you're fighting there. Well, one of the first game we were fighting the uh, VC, and the first forty-five days uh, that we were there, we did nothing but ambush, and we would patrol and s try to sleep during the day, and ambush at night. And uh, had been probably. Uh, I guess maybe a month that after I was there that we were out and the first night we encountered them uh, we were gone out on an ambush and got uh, caught in a rainstorm thunderstorm and stuff and they had two or three of them tried to get into our ambush. They walked into our ambush and uh, they opened up and, and it was on the other side of where I was, but the next thing I noticed that there was one dead VC floating in the water by me. But that was my first encounter. And day in and day out, it's basically the same thing. You would ambush at night, trying to stay awake and yeah. uh, you couldn't hardly really sleep during the day. It was too hot. And we did this. Did you ever have to walk point? I walked point one time for the whole company at night. And that was not a very good experience. It, <laughs> uh, how, how does a person, I hear you're rotated through, I hear you're assigned to that, or mm -hmm. young, the young, least experienced guys, I mean, is that, how do you get assigned to that position? Well, basically they rotated through the uh, platoon, and if, if our platoon was there, then one of the squads from that platoon, it was there, they were on point, and then if you were in that squad, they'd usually rotate it, and sometimes a lot of the older guys would walk, you know, because they were more experienced, and it wasn't necessarily you were just strung out there all the time. It just happened to be my time. What are you carrying? What type of weapon? M16? I carried an M16 and uh, I carried several different types of weapons. I uh, became a radio operator for the platoon and in November, I guess, I went in in. Left in July, so in November, October, I mean, yeah, November, I became a uh, radio operator for the company commander and did that the rest of the time I was there. And the first time you had combat, I mean, you made it, we referring to this time of this? You know, the, that was really no combat. That was basically just an ambush. Mm -hmm. Uh, started uh, the first real combat that we ran into was October the 9th of 67. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, basically that the story I showed you is uh, on the paper, that's what it's about. And it's written by the guys in the uh, company in the platoon. We'd been out uh, off of Firebase uh, Mary Lou and uh, had been out for three days already. We carried uh, three days rations with us all the time and uh, we'd been out three days we were going on the fourth day I guess and 
it uh, had been raining and stuff so bad that we couldn't get resupplied. And uh, we had sent out a patrol and they got into a firefight and everybody packed up and took off after them. And the whole company was supposed to charge online. And uh, we charged up the hill and we didn't know what we were running into, but we did run into a regimental size NVA force. And it was pretty bad for our company that day. We lost, I think it was uh, almost uh, better than a third of our platoon. I mean, our company. Uh, I can look right quick. I can tell you because I got the numbers down here. And I did have them down. But anyway, they... Uh, we had, uh, she's got it in that section over here. Okay, that's fine. That's that, uh, but uh, we lost, uh, I think, uh, on the back page, it'll show, I think, 13 uh, was killed and almost 20 uh, some wounded. Uh, that how, was, uh, how close did you get to the NBA? I mean, were they far <laughs> away or were they right no. in your face? Uh, different times, they were uh, within uh, arm's length of each other. Mm -hmm. uh, that particular day, we could see them running. They were within 50 to 75 yards away. Did you ever go through what's maybe like called a, a baptism of fire, where <laughs> you feel like you're invincible or bulletproof, and then when the bullets start flying, you realize you get, get killed? Is that something that's common with people in combat, go through something like that? No, but uh, you, you never felt that you were invincible. Uh, I didn't. I, I knew that at any time that you could get hit, uh, you know, you felt the, the bullets flying around you. Uh, we went through this on October the 9th. Uh, we were in the Alpha Company. We were always scattered the 9th of the month for the next four months. So we had five months in a row on the 9th of the month. We had a major confrontation with the NVA in the area that we were working. And November the 9th ended up being a day uh, that uh, I was supposed to walk point. Uh, had sprained my ankle and stuff the night before, and a uh, guy from uh, Baytown said he'd take my place. And that day the first shot rang out, it caught him between the eyes. Uh, it's something you'll never forget. That would have been you? That would have been me. I was about third or fourth back in the line, and uh, when the shot rang out, we all laid down. And I was laying on a rice paddy dike or trail, and I decided that wasn't the place to be, and slid off in the mud. And once I did, uh, the trail was tore up with a 50 caliber, and they they had it all sighted in. And we spent all day trying to maneuver around to get in, and there again we lost a lot of. A lot of good men that day. Um, that was one day when uh, we did cross the open rice paddy, got up against the berm where they were dug in, and you could see the, the hand came out of the bush with a grenade. And it was just lucky we were in rice paddy where it absorbed all the stuff and nobody got hurt from it. Wow. How many times have you run that scenario by about the guy at Walking Point that day and, and your sprained ankle? I mean, probably quite a few times, huh? Yeah, yeah. many a time. I. you remember the man's name? Mm hmm Robert Hale. I uh, went uh, two years ago on November 9th to Franklinton, Louisiana, where he's buried and visited his grave site. Have you ever been to Washington, D.C.? Yes. Did you ever go to the wall? Not there. Mm -hmm. I visited the moving wall. You found his name? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. wow. 
So obviously you lost some friends and people that you knew in Vietnam. Yeah, sure did. Do you ever use the helicopters for being transported to LZs or anything like that? Oh, yeah. Tell me about some of those trips and mm. what you're feeling if you're going into a hot LZ or, and all that. Well, the hot LZs were never really happened. You always thought they were hot when you went in. Uh, they, uh, they would always prep the LZ with uh, artillery and gunship fire and stuff. So it, so it really was scary coming in. You were up above circling, and when you're getting ready to come in, of course, uh, you, we never sat inside the chopper. Uh, when we did the uh, combat assaults, uh, everybody sat on the edge with their feet on the skids, and we stood when we were getting close to coming in. Uh, See, as, you, as you talk, I, I'm just seeing this, you know. <laughs> unfortunately, some of the only visuals I have is Hollywood, and they've done a poor job. But they, they, I'm thinking of We Were Soldiers with Mel Gibson, but um, mm -hmm. I can just picture that. I mean, is the adrenaline going? Are you guys mm -hmm. talking, or how do you feel just before yeah. you land? No, we're not talking. We're really not talking. We're just we're just looking and looking and trying to see where we're gonna where we're gonna jump out because you. You really didn't want to jump in the grass because there was always the, the deal of ma uh, mines or uh, bouncing beddies or the uh, bungee stakes. Mm -hmm. So you always kind of looked where you were going. And we made, you know, several of those uh, combat assaults. We, we made one one night, uh, late, in the, late in the afternoon, early night. At, uh, the you could see the tracer rounds coming through the choppers, and we were about seven, eight foot up, and door gunners were kicking us out. Said so get out, and we jumped in the rice paddies, and with all the weight that I carried with me, the radio and everything, uh, the only thing sticking out was my head when I landed, because I went feet first, and it was it was that deep and mud and water. Mm. You, you went on a lot of these missions or just a few comp uh, combat assaults or were there a lot of them? Basically, that's the way we moved from place to place. So, do, does, are there sounds today that maybe bring back Vietnam? I mean, if you hear a helicopter overhead? Yeah, you can, you can tell. And the Huey had a distinctive sound. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wop, wop. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody knows the Huey one that had been there. Mm -hmm. I'm fascinated by that. Um, <laughs> that's why I produced my first film on Vietnam. Mm -hmm. um, just the, the, the Air, Mo Air Mobile Division. Yeah. How important the Huey was. Tell me about the, the workhorse of Vietnam, the Huey. Uh, what, in your estimation, how important the Huey helicopter was, and what what the purpose of the helicopter was. Well, the uh, the area that. Uh, we went to work with the, uh, after, I guess, in October is when we, 67, we moved to the area south of Da Nang. We worked with the first air calf, and, of course, that was the biggest thing to Huey, is that's the way they transported us. That's where we got our resupplies with in uh, Medivac. Everything came by the Huey. And the gunships were basically Hueys at that time, converted. What, uh, 50 caliber? What was on those? No, they had M60s, which was 7.62s, uh, that were there, and they had rocket pods on the uh, gunships that they used. Some of them had uh, grenade larger type things that they shot uh, grenades set um, m79 grenades and that in itself was a distinct noise coming out as I listen to you Sonny it's like this happened yesterday I mean this is over 40 years ago but it's still pretty pretty yeah. vivid isn't it yes yeah. it's still there when you came home from Vietnam, did you talk about it? 
Mm, a little, not too much to begin with. Uh, tried to get back, in, I went back to school and tried to get into society. Started raising my family and started my marriage all over. And Now, before you went to Vietnam, had you ever been out of the country or been no. anywhere far from home? No. So were you ever homesick? Mm, I guess you were. You never paid that much attention to it. So you're, you're trained to go to war, and in boot camp you knew you were going to go to war, right? Yeah. Okay. But is there a mindset that they, they instill within you, or is it something you yourself decide that you're going to war, it's not the movies, you're going to war, and um, reality sets in, you're over there, and you're fighting for your country? That's right. I mean, you're there. That's, that's what you were... That's what you were drafted for, what you were trained for, and you're, that was your mission at that time. You were to do what you were told. And, you know, they trained you with the idea that if you followed their orders without asking questions and stuff, that you would probably stay alive, unless they made a bad decision. But there are times you question but not as much as uh, probably later in the war, uh, talking to some of the guys that were there later. Tell me about when you first got to Vietnam, the first couple of months versus toward the end of your tour, the way you were treated and then becoming more of a veteran of, the, of what you're doing. I mean, because you come in, what, you're a newbie? I mean, they call you these names. And, yeah. Um, <laughs> and is it true that a lot of those people got killed quicker than the guys that have been there for a few months, right? Yeah, probably. You know, the... Some of the people that you lost were were not there very long. They rotated pretty quick that way. But yeah, uh, it you were very cautious, I guess, as you got there toward what you were getting short. With your time, you knew your time was up to come back. And yeah, it's 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 very difficult to continue to push yourself to do. Uh, Basically, I had a job when, in the company CP that, that I was in the center of the company when we were in the field. So, you know, I felt a little bit safer. I uh, have a friend that uh, was short, had a few days left, and uh, stepped on a mine, lost his leg. Uh, but has a good attitude about it. I mean, he really has made something of itself in life, and it's, uh, it's one of those things that happen. Where does he live? In South Carolina. Stay in touch? See him every year. Good. You guys have a reunion? Every year. Where? D at different places? Different here? places. Tell me the, the group you're with again, the division, the company. It's the, well, we were with the 4th Infantry Division, the 35th, 1st of the 35th Division uh, Battalion, and the uh, we were in A Company. And the camaraderie is, is you guys are pretty close? Yes. Yeah. It uh, is something you look forward to every year. Uh, we started uh, 11, 12 years ago and uh, get to see uh, guys you serve with. Every year you see somebody different that uh, will show up. And. Uh, it's uh, a good feeling. Where are you going to meet this year? Pittsburgh. When? Uh, end of July. The last week in July, that's when we always have it. You get a couple hundred guys going to that? Or? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we uh, usually banquets. Uh, at the banquet, we'll have anywhere from 375 to 425. That's just the Vietnam era vets. Mm -hmm. Dory, you're doing great. Um, the information stuff. Okay, um, you're in Vietnam for a year, mm -hmm. and if I were to ask, you may have already answered, but if I were to ask what was the most difficult thing you had to do, what comes to your mind in Vietnam during that tour? What was the most difficult thing you had to do, or an encounter, or maybe the worst thing you saw? Any of the above. Uh, most difficult, probably walking to point that night for the company. Uh, Things that I encountered, uh, being ambushed one day and 
seeing the guy that had taken me under the wing when I got his wing when I got there to teach me the ropes, uh, seeing him get shot in uh, in the opening and and then running out there after the medic was there with him and seeing the medic get shot and loading both of them on a uh, poncho and pulling them 50 yards to safety to get them out of the line of fire. But that was probably the most difficult. Have not seen him. He did make it back alive. Uh, I'm trying to locate him through the organization and we're working on it right now, so. What's his name? Uh, mm, no, not right off the top of my head. Did the medic make it? Yes, both of them made okay, it. Okay, they both made it. Wow, what a reunion that would be, huh? Yes, I, uh, this last reunion uh, in last July, and uh, we met in Reno. Mm -hmm. Saw the guy for the first time that uh, was my cohort and RTO radio operator with me that we were side by side, side by side probably six months or more and first time I've seen him in since I left in 68 good good feeling sure. saw a lot of other guys for the first time from out that way but uh, hopefully some more will show up this year you helped those two gentlemen how about some of the medevac flights? Did you ever help load some of the choppers? As yes. Guy, remember anything come to mind when I asked you that? Or I mean, were you able to help somebody get out? Yeah, yeah the deal on uh, October the 9th, being a radio operator that night, uh, bringing in a medevac at night. Supposedly we were still in the fire, and supposedly from what they tell me, I don't remember. I talked a guy down in to our perimeter or over the radio and basically stood up with two flares to bring him in. And thinking back, it's kind of stupid, but it was something that needed to be done. Uh, I did uh, many a time, talked the medevacs in over the radio and helped load uh, uh, the wounded or even help load the body bags, which is not a, you usually loaded them all on the same thing if you had room, if you didn't have a whole bunch. Were you guys under fire at times when the medevacs came in? Yes. So why do you think you survived and came home? <laughs> God's will. You ever think about that, or is it? I know some of the veterans I've talked to feel a little guilty sometimes. Even I don't know that they survive, but um, I'm glad you made it back. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not really guilty. It's just you think what his plan was for you. Well, that story you told about not walking point—that's that's an amazing story right there. Mm -hmm. You know. That guy took that bullet. Yeah. He was the first one that day, and the guys, the last guy that day that got killed was uh, the guy I took the radio for, for the company. He got shot going out that night trying to crawl out. And I was right behind him. And how, you know, how all of these situations work themselves out, who knows? Did you ever question why you were there in mm -hmm. Vietnam? Not really. How about the morale of the troops? Was it good? Yes, I think it was. I think nobody really wanted to be there. But, you know, that was part of what, uh, what we were drafted and told to do. That was part of our duty to our country. You know, back home, it was referred to as an unpopular war. I don't know if there's such a thing. But <laughs> did that creep into the ranks at all over there, where you guys are pretty focused on, mm -hmm. you had a job to do, and you're going to yeah. do it? 
in, our, in the area, in what we were doing and stuff, we were never, never really had the idle time to, to sit around and think about it. We had no uh, comforts. I mean, you carried with you what you had day in and day out. I mean, we never spent that much time in the, in the rear. And we may be out, like I said, the first time we were out 45 days before we went back in. And we may be out two or three weeks before we'd get back in. Um, um, what, what happens during this time? I mean, that progression of time, encounters, you see people die. I mean, what kind of mindset do you have about life and just fighting for your country? I mean, I don't know if that's a fair question. <laughs> I mean, I would think over a process of time, it can't come become routine. If it does, you're probably going to get killed. So it's no, like, no, you just are your, are your leaders keeping you on your toes? Is it? It's like you know. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you you're basically trying to uh, survive day in and day out. You're taking one day at a time. You depend on the guys around you to have the same mindset of surviving. And, and moving on, you have, a, have people that look out for one another. And, uh, you know, there are, there are a lot of funny times and a lot of good times. Uh, basically, you know, if you had a major firefight once or twice a month, that was it. The uh, rest of the time you spent, we spent humping the bush and doing different things, but, uh, you know, then you never, you may have encounter snipers or stuff like that, but then you'd, you'd move on. And uh, you never had time for the, uh, to know what was going on back here. Never had time for the dope and stuff that they say we use so much. I never, uh, I saw maybe twice while I was there. That, but guys in the field depended on each other too much to let let that happen. You mentioned Duck Foe. Mm -hmm. Were you? Is that your base, or is that where you were? Mm, that was the first fire base we went into. Our main base was at Play Coup. Okay, um, excellent. In Central Highlands. Central Highlands. Sixty-seven. You went to Vietnam. What month was that? July. So you got out in June or July of sixty-eight. July of sixty-eight. Did you go to the Tet Offensive? Yes. Can you tell me about that? Tet Offensive. Uh, we were up on the Laotian Cambodia border. We, my company and one other company, set up a uh, fire base as a blocking force. And we could sit and watch uh, some of the explosions and stuff going on in Da Nang. Uh, never did feel any of the stuff. Of course, we were way out in the boonies. We're not on a major trail or anything, but we were there. Never ran into anything, but we knew what was happening. That's one of the campaigns, I guess, that people are a little more familiar with, you know, yeah. the Tet Offensive, but um, what, why were you guys called grunts? Can you, I've asked that. <laughs> what's, your, what's your definition of a grunt? You know, probably the way we, what we, what we haul and we grunt it every time you, and you, you crawled around in the mud and the slush and the rice paddies and uh, you, uh, <laughs> I mean, what you humped is what you had with you. You know, I figured, uh, as I sat and thought about it over the years, I, I probably humped about 100 to 125 pounds of pack every day. You know, the radio we had back then uh, probably weighed 20-some pounds, plus each battery uh, that went in it weighed, uh, you know, three to six pounds, and you carried extra batteries. Plus, you carried all your ammo, nine days, uh, nine meals of sea rations, uh, three canteens, your weapon. That's tough. That's incredible. 
<laughs> I, I heard you were called a grunt because you know you have all this stuff on your back and you jump out of the helicopter and that's the sound you make. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably so. You know, like when you. Uh, I never thought about the sound I made when I hit the water that night, you know, and that probably was. But uh, basically, you were standing close enough, you took one step off, you know, but unless you got, it was too hot, then you had to jump out quicker. But uh, it, uh, it was something that I went through, and when I came back, I, I was probably one of the guys that uh, gained weight. And it was probably all muscle. I went from about 190 pounds to 205 and uh, was uh, pretty solid. So, Vietnam today in your life, does it have a place in your life or is it something you want to forget? Or But you got your reunion, so you're kind of, yeah. you know. Yeah, and I don't think I'll ever go back. They take tours and yeah, there are people from our association. Uh, matter of fact, our guy that's president this year of the association has lived there six to eight months at a time. And uh, we help uh, one of the guys that uh, was an interpreter from us, South Vietnamese. We, every year we send him money or stuff to help him and his family because he really can't find a job. But if you go back, he'll... He'll take you around and do whatever for you. Several years ago, we bought him a moped. So, but he was a friend while we were there. Mm -hmm. When you came home, was there a homecoming of sorts, or was there some of the horror stories like I hear? In <laughs> what happened to you? And tell, well, tell me about your last day in Vietnam, and then tell me about your homecoming. Last day, Cameron Bay. Woke up early morning to get on the plane. Uh, spent the last few days process, out processing, and then Cameron Bay is where we left from to come home. And got up that morning and watched the sun come up. Got on the plane and watched the sun go down. Watched the sun come back up. Landed in Seattle. Changed clothes into a, oh, I got a Class A uniform. and. Cleaned up, got my orders, and watched the sun go down, went to the airport, got on a plane, and flew to Houston. A total of about 25, 26 hours total. Uh, met my wife at the airport that night and uh, spent 30 days leave, and I still had five, six months to go, so the hardest part then was going, I went to Fort Meade, Maryland, which is out of Washington, D.C., and I was on riot control duty for Washington, D.C. I was in a unit that uh, had been in when they burned 14th Street. And you had no ammunition and nothing. All you had was tear gas and a rifle you could use as a club, and that was about it. But uh, spent those last five months in there around Washington, D.C. And uh, got out right before Christmas. So did you ever get a Bronze Star? No. No medals. Army accommodation. Purple Heart. CIB? CIB. Purple Heart? Yes. When were you wounded? November of 67. Or what happened to you? Mm. We had made a CA into an area of combat assault and went through a village and all the peasants were standing there saluting us with left hands and walked through and walked out on the other side and uh, the lead platoon ran into an ambush and we settled down as a company CP group and behind a big berm and I dropped a mortar around him about 10 foot from us into the rice paddy. Just happened to catch a 
couple pieces of the shrapnel through my shoulder and through my arm and couldn't get out. Stayed the whole night in the rice paddy in the mud and stuff and finally got out the next day when I took the whole company out. And when I got back to the aid safe station, uh, my, from here to here was just that, was that infected. I spent hmm, 20 some days in the hospital and it was back with the unit right before Christmas. Did you know you were hurt the time when I mean, the shrapnel hit? I mean, obviously. Yeah. It, yeah. Were you bleeding and wanting a medic and were you going to survive? And... Mm -hmm. No, just there again, luck. Uh, around the, the piece that went through my shoulder went through two sets of straps, my pack strap and my uh, web pack strap and uh, pulled all the straw and stuff inside, but it ended up sitting right on my shoulder blade, which if that probably wasn't there, I probably wouldn't have a right shoulder anymore. But uh, the medic, the head medic, was right there with us, so uh, there was nothing he could do with it. I mean, it wasn't bleeding that much. It was a pretty close wound. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, one, two or three others in the same company commander got a piece through his leg, and, and some of the other people with us. We had a Photographer for um, National Geographic is with us, mm. and he got some in his eyes and stuff. And he was blinded for a while, and we had to lead him around. But he's he's better. He's living in Washington, and somewhere I have an eight by ten picture, black and white picture that he took of us that day. You have it somewhere? Somewhere can't find it. Uh -huh. <laughs> You need to find it. <laughs> you got to scan it. Uh -huh. no, that would be perfect. Yeah. When you go home at some point and look, you live here in Brown. Mm -hmm. If you can try to dig something up today or tomorrow, I'll be here through tomorrow. Okay. Bring them down. Carol at the front desk will scan those. Okay. If you can't find that one, bring what you have. But yeah. your, your story is outstanding, so we need to get some pictures. Yeah, I, I have a lot of good pictures and stuff. and. Uh, if, they're, if they're in an album, bring them down or in a frame. Yeah, we can take them out. So just... I, uh, I have two daughters that have taken everything I had and are making a scrapbook out of it. Yeah. And then, uh, I've had it done and they, um, they decided it needed to be updated, so they've confiscated it and updating it. So, but it would have been nice to have because I think there's a lot of good pictures and stuff that I have of it. And they did a good job of putting it together. Perfect. We We take it to the reunions so we can see each other. I'm going to ask you a question. Um, uh -huh. I ask all the veterans this question, but just think about it for a moment. But being a veteran and having gone through Vietnam and living in this country, what does freedom mean to you, Sonny? <laughs> Freedoms. The old cliche is not free. It's not. And freedom is not the freedom to do whatever you want to. You still have to abide by the laws and the, and uh, whatever there is in this country. You still have the right to do everything, the freedom to vote and to elect your leaders and to be able to voice your opinion about people that uh, may not agree with you, but you still have that right to do that. But this country is a whole lot better than a lot of others. And I have no desire to go anywhere else. What about the price for freedom? We're going to be at the high school tomorrow, and one of the mm -hmm. things you'll hear me say is, you know, I'll challenge the kids with the thought of, you know, they're, they live, they're free. They live in a free country. You know, what does freedom mean to them? Um, 
it's different when I ask you or someone yeah. that's been in combat, but what about the price of freedom, the, the, the cost, the sacrifices? I mean, what would, you, what would you comment on that? And if you were speaking before young people, what would you tell them about the price for freedom? We keep our freedoms. The price of freedom uh, takes a lot of sacrifice. Uh, you sacrifice people's lives. You sacrifice uh, time and effort. Uh, you sacrifice basically your whole life because you live with that constantly if you go into combat. There's no way to get around it. Uh, we have been, uh, the nations that uh, do this have developed many ways of injuring and mutilating bodies, people. Uh, a lot of it doesn't show up uh, in the beginning and right at the first. It may take years. And a lot of the Vietnam veterans probably are suffering or beginning to suffer now from a lot of the effects of Agent Orange and everything else. But they have to realize that if they want the freedoms to succeed in life and to do what they need to do what they want to do, they have to be willing to defend that freedom. And that means giving up something. It's hard to give up friends and cousins. I lost two uncles in World War II. Were they together, serving together, or what? No. No. Both were infantry, different units. Were they in, in Europe or Pacific? Europe. Both of them? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have pictures of them? Mm-hmm. Would you be able to bring one of those in the scan too? Yeah, both of them are uh, the old time frames, the curved glass in the front of them. Yeah, probably can't take them off. Mm -mm. The good. frames are about to fall apart. Yeah. And, uh, Unless they're... you want to change frames, I'll leave that up to you. No. <laughs> so you, have, you have people in your family that have served in the yeah. military. Yeah, one of my uncles killed. had the same name as I do. Mm. And he was killed before I was born. Where's he buried? Germany, yeah. Europe. Mm -hmm. I have a letter. Uh, met one of his buddies from Navsota several years ago at a mm -hmm. VFW veterans function that served with him, that was with him. I have a letter from him that he wrote to one of my other cousins here mm -hmm. that uh, explained what happened to him. When I have his purple heart, but you know, he has a marker at a cemetery here, but that's it. I have another uncle, the other uncle is, I have a marker for him in another cemetery here, but he's in Europe somewhere. He, well, they never really found anything. He went into a building as far as the accounts go, and the artillery shell hit the building, and that was it. So. Tell me what the American flag means and represents to you as a veteran and as an American citizen. <laughs> well, the American, the flag itself, the red, white, and blue. I mean, uh, the red's the blood, the blue is the sacrifices, and the white's the purity of it. I mean, that's, that's part of it. it. It's a very important symbol Gives you both goosebumps when you see it. And that's why it flies 24 hours a day at my house. Do you think, why do you think it's important that we share these stories? I mean, with the World War II veterans, I've done a lot of, a lot of work with them. Mm -hmm. Korea veterans, Vietnam. Why do you think it's important we share this with our younger generation or just with our society? Well, maybe they would get a better 
understanding of what what people go through to what they sacrifice for their for the freedom that everybody enjoys and that it's not a, a glamour mm -hmm. it's uh, if you produced a reality show nowadays you wouldn't be able to compare it and there's just no way that anybody can understand what you go through unless you were there doing it and it's uh, a very uh, important to remember history, I think. I think uh, not even knowing these two uncles that I had, not knowing what they went through, but just from talking to the other people, that little piece of memory that I have. And I think everybody should have that. What do you think our country should remember about Vietnam? Well, I'm sure they're not going to remember the, the things that we did. What we usually ask the people at the reunion that came after us, we want to know what happened. We were winning when we left in 68. What happened? You know, but... The consensus is, I think, that a lot of people thought it was a political war, fought that way, you know, and we just dropped it and left. We had no clear understanding of what, what we wanted to do. The people need to remember that it was not something that we lost. I don't think we lost. We just gave up on it. And we let, we let the people come in and take over and do what they want to do. What would you tell a Vietnam vet today? You could look into the camera and talk to some Vietnam vets that might watch this. What, what, what would you tell them? Basically what we say is welcome home. And give them a hug. lesson learned from Vietnam? Have we learned lessons today from the Vietnam War? Mm, probably have some. Basically we're not treating the returning vets as, as we did back then. All the vets have more of an understanding. We're, we're trying to communicate with them through the service organizations and stuff. And we're not uh, to the point where we, I don't think those vets try to hide their service as much as the rest of them did. Are you proud to be a Vietnam veteran? Yes. Yes, I am. And do people thank you for your service? Yes. How does that make you feel? Humble. I carry a purple heart plate on my car and I've been asked several times when I get out, are you the, are you the one? And then, yes, and well, thank you. It makes you feel good these days. But it, you know, this hadn't happened except in the last 15 years or so. But uh, it is one of those things that makes you feel like you may have done something right. Well, I want to thank you for what you've done. Thank you. All these years later, I want to thank you. Who would have ever thought that? When you landed in Duck Fo and then set the highlands of Play Cool, that 40 years later I'd meet you and we'd be talking like this. That's right. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing that we can talk to each other and explain stuff. And I think it's important that the kids, the young people, see what's happening. I mean, we've done this. I've talked to classes before. I gave speeches at high schools. And around here and stuff before on, on this. Good for you. And I think, I think they need to know that veterans have sacrificed for them. And you're coming tomorrow to the high school, right? For mm -hmm. sure? Yeah. Good, perfect.
Um, I think I'm done. I could go on for a long time, <laughs> but I'm going to behind. But I'm going to ask you to do one more thing. I hope you're okay with this. Okay. If you see some of my films, you'll understand why I do this out of respect. But um, I ask the veterans to give me a salute into the camera from where you're seated when I ask you. Can you do that? Okay. Okay, just get it. Okay, Sonny, right into the camera. Go ahead. Excellent. Thank you.